Good tidings, all you beautiful individuals. Welcome back to League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with your beauties. Little bit of weekend recap action. And I know people might be starting to panic around the T1 truck business. We might start sending them as an emergency to get Faker extracted to even better medical care. But we had them matching up against Gen G, and I don't think many people were expecting them to win against Gen G, especially in current form, but it was another series where this team definitely looks a little bit lost without the GOAT in the mid lane. And yeah, everybody is taking a look at how they valued Faker, what they saw of the T1 dynasty, and understanding that aside from even just raw gameplay, and even to the degree that you had to guess, there was of that, uh, you know, uh, you know, comms and everything else, the shot calling coming through from him for the team, the organization. We obviously undervalued just to how significant a degree it was responsible for the success of T1 and especially this iteration of T1. You see quite a heavy effect of that in the series against Genji. Everyone seems to be playing at a lower standard. I think you have Kyria having a whole lot more on his plate without Faker there in terms of shot calling and just leading the team. So even his individual performance has taken a dip. And I mean, they're just not on the same page, not all taking fights, all moving forward. It seems like we knew Faker was important. We knew individually he was playing at a high level. We knew he was the leader of these young players, but it feels like now there's too much pressure that Faker's just gonna come back and fix all these issues that T1's gonna be showing. I know they initially said he's gonna be out at least two weeks, but I think you and I both know this is gonna be a much longer break than two weeks. He has, you know, they're talking about carpal tunnel syndrome and they're talking about him not being able to even lift up his arm at certain points due to the severity of it. I can tell you that even just a very, you know, standard case of carpal tunnel, you're going to be out or should be resting longer than those two weeks and doing much more so. So to, to think about Faker rushing back in any type of situation to, to secure something for T1 when you're looking at the long-term situation, and again, even with someone like Faker, who is, quote unquote, in that older part of the territory of being a professional uh, esports player, you gotta be careful on when you're coming back. And if you're rushing this type of situation, I don't think anybody, even the most diehard of T1 fans, would want to see someone like Faker rush back from an injury this severe. Well, you're talking about permanent damage and you know lifelong repercussions for him. So absolutely no one's going to be rushing that. I think they're going to be... I think even him coming back for playoffs is probably rushed still in terms of that. So, I mean, I, I thought T1... It's only been two series, I know, and Gen G is... 10 and 0 now incredibly dominant so still think there's obviously enough talent and they'll be able to sort things out but you combine Bangi just stepping away all of a sudden in the middle of the season and that just adds to the chaos of who's who's in charge here who's going to be leading this squad when you lose your head coach and your main shot caller it's scary because you start to think about the Jenga tower of T1 falling that point because you've taken away two gig you know two incredibly significant pillars obviously the most significant one in faker the unkillable demon king the true leader of t1 and then bengi who of course is the head coach and has all this history with the organization for him to be stepping down you know personal reasons that he's talking about and the feelings of uh, you know responsibility for some of the lack of success or performance in these crucial moments for t1 in recent history there's some valid points to be looking at that, but to have that happen at this time with everything else in this path for T1, it is incredibly shaky. Happy side of things, Genji. 10 and 0, look good as usual, and Doran continues to be getting the recognition he deserves. He looks like the best top laner in the LCK. That's it. And I don't want people thinking we're crazy or ignoring MSI, but to see these type of signs from someone like Doran, what this means for the composition of Gen G and what they can do and how they can beat you is an additional plus for them. Having Doran be at this type of level, showcasing it. Yes, we talked about the level of play from T1 and specifically the ups and downs, of course, of Zeus throughout the course of this and this year outside of that lead up to MSI. 
you know, Doran getting that job done, looking this type of way, Tay's continuing to thump anybody he comes across. This is the Gen G that is at the top, excuse me, of the LCK standings. 10 and 0, perfect. But on the other side, in the LPL, one of the Titans show that they can bleed. All it takes is an absolute masterclass blitzcrank performance from IG Wink. I, I don't think anyone expected someone to end this 11 game win streak of JDG for it to be a three and 10 Invictus Gaming Squad. Oh baby, if you were holding on to your ticket from IG's early hype at the beginning of the year, number one, you're crazy. I don't know who you are <laughs> holding on to that, but number two, you're cashing it in on this mega upset win against JDG. Oh, does IG, and again, I know there's some hype and there's the potential there. We've talked about it, I believe. But how do this does this team perform the way that they do on most of the occasions and have wins against JDG and LNG and then just two other? That is incredible in the LPL. And you saw just how good JDG has been because a now 4-10 squad that's long eliminated from playoffs, they were pumped after this win. Of course, only the second series <laughs> loss for JDG, but they're clapping. Yes, nice boys, because JDG has looked absolutely unbeatable. They needed some insane hooks from Wink, incredible back and forth team fights. They needed a Baron steal. It still looked like JDG might win this game, but IG, full marks, full credit to them. They played a fantastic third game. And that is the, you know, you talk about it. It's almost like they're winning worlds, winning the championship type of reaction to beating a team like JDG. And you realize, well, that pretty much is for this year for IG. They're not going to most likely get any type of opportunities. There's, I mean, there's still a little bit of runway room if they get on a stretch to push into the LPL playoffs for this split. But it really is that opportunity, that David and Goliath moment where they realize we have taken down one of the very best of the best. And, you know, BLG is shaking IG's hands because that probably most likely <laughs> locks up the first seed for them as they won another series to move to 13 and 1. Obviously, first and second seed doesn't really matter, especially because JDG has beaten BLG about 55 times in a row. Oh, I would love to say that it actually does matter. There is some avenue of it. But as you said, having that advantage, having that head to head matchup record that you have as JDG. You're not sweating any bullets whatsoever when you're thinking about a seeding or positioning in these LPL playoffs. Not worried one little bit. And I think that, again, this is one of those ones where normally there'd be a way to hyper analyze and look at the mistakes and needle point and criticize a team like JDG. But realizing the pace of the schedule, everything else, this is just another one of those games where you just kind of have to move on and look to the next one. And they have built so much clout not even you can ignore msi you can look solely at their games in the summer split and dropping one game even to a you know upset loss like ig and you're barely even batting an eye to jdg you're still absolutely terrified of this squad very scared of them but you better believe there are other big fish waiting in that lpl pond we've got a couple of them to talk about some people making some big moves and shaking at the very least the top half of the lpl says Gods can bleed as JDG drops a game. BLG hasn't bled in a while, but JDG showing that it is possible to actually take a series away from them. Over to LCS action, and we got to talk. There's been a lot of shocks, surprises so far in the LCS. We got a head-to-head -head example of it. And you got to say, what has been a bigger surprise or what is more shocking? Because Dignitas... Looks like an actually legit team in the LCS that could make some noise, which I don't think anyone would have said seeing this roster. And still hard-pressed to be a bigger surprise than FlyQuest. 0-3 this week, 3-10 and overall now. They are absolutely, I can't believe I'm going to say it, in the category where you're concerned about them making top 8 in the LCS. Yikes! Yikes, that is not a place that you want to be talking about if you're any LCS organization because we've made ourselves very clear about the, you know, an eight team playoff and what that brings in and what, what level of competition we have here in the LCS. And if you are on the outside looking in, I tell you what, that story is even worse. And that's where FlyQuest finds themselves after this 0-3 weekend just coming off of that bounce back weekend where we said there were signs of life 
but it was one of those ones where you still were looking at what happened and going there's still so much wrong there's still so many areas where that can be taken advantage of and punished and that's where we head into this weekend where it once again was by the rest of the opposition in the in the lcs and again 10 losses it's not like you're only losing to the best teams of the lcs they're losing to everybody not named immortals and that is an issue because great you're better than immortals congratulations you don't get a medal for that one and dignitas listen rich looking like victory five looking like peak nong shim rich dominating some of these lcs matchups rolling the ignite rumble getting solo kills jensen is looking like vintage jensen so far and you've got so many positive things to talk about dignitas we keep throwing these things out to say what's crazier than the FlyQuest start? Well, the answer is nothing. You can't draw up anything that's happened in the LCS that's more insane than this stacked FlyQuest roster looking so unbelievably bad. There's just so many questions still about it. You know, Vikla had an interview and he's talking about where he even identifies that he's probably performing as the 10th, the worst mid laner in the LCS right now, which, you know, I don't think you're going to get a lot of people arguing against it, but I think there should be a lot of people that are going, how did we get here? This is not what should be the expectation, the performance. There's a whole other factor to be talking about that. You know, 19-year-old player, best of one versus best of three away from home. All sorts of things can factor in and lead to these type of things happening. But it truly is sad to see it for FlyQuest to dissolve and disappear this level of competition for the team. But this, this performance would have made more sense almost in spring when it was this team coming together and trying to figure things out. But you had such a dominant start and spring. We're looking so good, fall off a bit, and then you're expecting a massive bounce back in summer. How did both Vikla and Prince have fall off such cliffs from what we saw in spring? I can't just, I can't believe just Vulcan coming over onto this squad makes them play that much worse. Well, that's the thing. Again, we know that from Ayla's talking points again before they had that little bit of a grudge match was saying that there were issues with FlyQuest even before he got there or even aside from him in that type of situation so we know that there are some things uh, behind the scenes and it just is one of those ones where you know a player like Vulcan you know his attitude and I know there are people that are not fans of that type of attitude seeing an interview with him recently talking about how poorly things have gone the struggles with that FlyQuest team I've never seen him more depressed and more down in his energy talking about the struggles that this team has been going through. There's still, God bless the LCS format, chance for them. All they need to do is sneak into playoffs, but we're not seeing many positive signs in terms of turning in the right direction. Great, they had one 3-0 week, but three wins to their name is nothing to get excited about for this FlyQuest squad. One thing to get excited about in the LCS is now domestic talent mark maybe it's time to actually invest in academy because you've got both insanity coming back to the tsm lineup he's picking up player of the week honors it's a 3-0 week for the boys and apa making his debut replacing harry on team liquid and this guy's first ever week in the lcs he looks dominant he's talking trash in all chat he's spamming emotes look at these academy boys dominating Hey, them NA mids just built different, my guy. Love seeing that type of attitude and energy and entertainment coming across out on the rift. And this is certainly one of the ones where, again, I think we're all going to be uh, proven right and see that this will be ignored by the higher ups of the people in the position of power. But this is such a great response after everything that happened with the LCS walkout, the academy situation. They just say, hey, well, here's some of the domestic talent that nobody was betting on before and they're performing at this type of level in the LCS. They are certainly making their shockwaves, making the differences. Insanity is the big one we've talked about with TSM. But for Appa to step in, this is again, a slightly different situation with what, what was there with Harry and everything else. But again, domestic NA talent coming through, being given these opportunities and performing on this LCS stage. Love to see that. And listen, one of the biggest things I think people have talked about with the LCS having such low viewership people don't seem invested is not having the personalities that we've had in years past how about a dude coming in and typing in all chat losing to an academy mid xd spamming emotes non-stop backing it up i know we love to harp on guys and push them down trash talk them 
when they talk a little smack and then don't perform. But if you're going to do that, give them praise when they back up the trash talk. And that's exactly what this guy did in his debut. And you look at some of the most fun players and moments across the world, all major regions. This isn't just an LCS toxicity thing. You can go to the LEC, the LPL, LCK, flashing the emotes, the all chat. It's there too. So we love to see this type of stuff, this type of engagement going on. And you know what? Shout out to the LCS broadcast. This is something that I think, you know, probably was a slam dunk type of one, easy to, to bank on anyways, but going to give them the props for it. Getting APA on to the broadcast after that debut, getting to inter introduce himself to some of the viewers, have a little bit more of a chat, show that personality. These are the things that we want to see showcased on that LCS broadcast. And, you know, because we're coming off that week where Harry was not good whatsoever for Team Liquid, if APA even keeps playing at close to this level, all of a sudden, really, Team Liquid can ascend to that top tier in the LCS. It really starts to ease some of those question marks, some of those, you know, asterisks of concern that you had for this Team Liquid team as you saw them leveling up, building up, and rising up in these LCS standings. You looked at that inconsistency in that mid lane position as the specific one, and it really was one of those ones where even if you did get that good start, get those advantages, you started to question how are you going to convert it to that mid to late game and close out the game. I don't think you're having those concerns right now. You're having that confidence. You're having that energy that APA is bringing to that mid lane. And again, even below that, TSM and Dignitas look like teams that you legit can't underestimate when playoffs do roll around. I don't know if they stole the talent or the powers from FlyQuest, but it seems like that's been the sacrifice to have these perennial bottom tier, middle tier at best teams really ascending here in summer. Tell you the best thing about it, they didn't. It's just been here all along. The NA talent coming through, insanity being that exciting, and again, big time difference making player for a team like TSM is something that's throwing them into that situation. Talking about APA, hey man, it's just the NA world. So they're just built different. We don't know the full details of what TSM was spending on Ruby's contract and everything, oh, but you got to see this example if you're other LCS teams and say, okay, you spend a bunch of money on a guy who's frankly, performance wise, not worth the import slot. And then you say, oh man, we had this little guy in Academy this whole time who was just leaps and bounds better for probably a fraction of the cost. And it's not as simple as just, oh, we got to listen to the community all the time type of thing. But I mean, this one was pretty clear from the get go for a lot of people looking at this type of situation. But yes, very thrilled, very excited. I will always hype up and prop up these type of opportunities and moments that we are getting of these NA mids popping off. Can't wait for the orgs to ignore it and have another import slot next year and just bring more guys over and send these boys back to the academy scene. One guy you're never going to see in an academy scene anywhere is Mr. Jackie Love, who is looking like it is vintage 2018. Kais is back in the meta. He's getting a marquee matchup against OMG. And what does he do? All he does is set or tie an LPL record with 18 kills jackie love is looking like he is in absolute peak performance heading into this final week of regular season in the lpl oh my goodness is he ever at that type of level i think you know what it was it had to have been uzi stepping back in for edg it gave jackie love that reminder that confidence boost to go oh that guy's your goat he's your god hand he doesn't have a championship as a chinese adc oh, he brought that over to the LPL region. It is Jackie Love's time. And man, he is absolutely shining. That aggression that we always love to talk about with Jackie Love is what the forefront being one of those big things. But man, the mechanics are just always so crispy clean from this guy. And, and again, this is the guy who set the whole thing backwards last year. What is this? <laughs> well, you know, you live in the die by Jackie Love, but this year, all you're doing is living. You're thriving as this guy is. He seems to have been pulled back. I don't know if we want to give extra credit to Mark. Kind of, you know, easing him back. But Jackie Love has been right there with Ruler in terms of, and Elk, in terms of best 80 carries in the LPL so far in this summer split. TES moved to 10-4. and four. They're looking great heading into playoffs. OMG, the other side of things. You know, we had this very competitive series against TES. Unfortunately, they followed that up with an 0-2 against Thundertalk. And they're, they're going the wrong way heading into this last week of the regular season. 
This is one of those ones where I think uh, very clearly I'm starting to see that aspect of the schedule wear down on a team like OMG, where you can have this type of situation where you are performing at a certain type of level, you get knocked down, you get a little bit of bump in the road, and you don't have that time to fully recover, reset, rebound type of situation. That's where you can have some of these performances come through like we saw in that recent match for OMG. I've still got that faith. I'm still bought in to what they've got going on there that they will get back to that level of performance sooner rather than later. And, you know, nine out of the 10 playoff spots of the LPL are already pretty much locked up. It's just seeding that's going to shift around. But again, we know how important seeding is. Finishing ninth versus finishing fourth. Obviously, massive implications for not just world championship points, but how far you're going to go in summer. So still plenty to be playing for for the rest of these squads. We had a rare banger matchup in the LCK, and it didn't include T1, didn't include Gen.G. No D plus Kia. It was Hanwha Life versus Kwangdong Freaks, the next second, more likely third, fourth tier of LCK squads. But man, this was a back and forth. It was 2-0, but that doesn't fully give it justice because we had some insane team fights in this series. Man, someone someone called the doctors. I'm getting too close to the hopium supply once again, and I'm thinking Han will life. Looking at some struggles from T1, we might be seeing them climb up the charts, carve themselves out a better spot for these LCK playoffs. And if everything is lining up, this could be the run for this type of team. I think we saw today some signs of some better overall play from a lot of members of the team that we have been nitpicking on. But of course, leading that charge and being that star player for this team as he has been pretty much the entirety of this time is Viper in that bottom lane being a mega difference. Yeah, he reaches a thousand kills in the LCK. This team has looked much better since Grizzly replaced Clint in that jungle spot you saw some better performances Zeka on his patented Yone looking better still not at that world championship form haven't gotten that since he came over to Hanwha um, but yeah now they're sitting fourth T1 has dropped to fifth place because their game score 13 and 10 overall is really not that great and I know I said seeding doesn't really matter T1 as long as Baker comes back they could be sixth place and just roll through playoffs and maybe it's better for them to have more games to kind of ramp things up but not looking great still don't want to be going fifth sixth into playoffs if you're T1 there's some level of it that you're not concerned about but there is always at least some percentage where you're like yeah but we need this at least or whatever to keep that safety valve safety zone open for the team it's gonna be pretty tight i think when you're looking at this one again uh you know how i would handle it or i'm understanding the situation of faker's injury it's gonna be a little bit longer than they're obviously letting out right now type of timeline you're gonna be pushing into that territory and it is gonna be about number one those four players on t1 of the main starting roster that how are they gonna level up how are they gonna make it through without the granddaddy the papa that's been there beside them the whole time in mr faker so this is going to be the big test for t1 especially when that top half of the lck not just gen g throw in kt as well because that top two they've dropped six games total so far in the summer split kt is looking at another level of dominance as well alongside g uh gen g that top half of the lck looking absolutely stacked but that is it today for League Unlock, Eric and Mark here with you beautiful people. As always, thank you for watching and we will catch you on that flippity flip.